Okay, so hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about an important headache disorder that is migraine. Okay, so migraine is the second most common cause of primary headache. So what is the most common cause of primary headache? That is tension type headache. So tension type headache is the most common cause of primary headache. That's an important MCQ question. Next, female patients are involved more than males and there are two major types of migraine. So migraine that is associated with aura, this is known as classical or neurological migraine. So remember that only 20 to 25 patients, 20 to 25 percentage of the patients with migraine will experience aura. And then we have migraine without aura and this is known as common migraine. And as the name suggests, it is more common than classical or neurological migraine. Now come to the epidemiology. So migraine is a very strong family history, especially in classical migraine and neurological migraine. So classical and neurological migraine has a strong family history and onset is usually in adolescence and late adulthood, usually before the age of 30. And migraine is more common in the white and African populations compared to the Asian population. Now what are the important triggers of migraine? So it's very important to remember that patients with migraine are very sensitive to sensory stimuli. So bright lights, sounds. So these are very important triggers of migraine. The other triggers are going to be hunger, physical exertion, changes in weather like stormy weather or barometric pressure changes and then menses. So mens during menstruation migraine get triggered and there are certain patients who will have migraine only during the menstrual cycle. So this is known as catamenial migraine or menstrual migraine. It's a very very important MCQ question and then both lack of sleep as well as excess of sleep, alcoholism and let down from stress. So let's, let's say for example the patient's been working the entire week and then for two days he's going to have leave. So this relief from stress or this letdown from stress is a very important trigger for migraine. And then tyrum and rich food items like chocolate and cheese. Okay, now come into the phases of migraine. So remember there are four phases of migraine. Okay, so there are four phases of migraine. Okay, now we'll discuss each in detail. So we have the aura phase. So as we discussed earlier, aura is present only in 20 to 25 percent of migraine patients. It's usually short lived. This phase is only for less than 30 minutes. So we have two types of aura. Okay, so aura can be visual. This is the most common type of aura. Visual aura is the most common type of aura. And then we can also have aura can also present as certain neurological issues. Okay, we'll discuss about this later. Aura can also present with certain neurological deficit or neurological symptoms. But the most common type of aura is going to be visual aura. This is a very important MCQ. So what are the different types of visual aura? So the visual aura can be in the form of flashing lights or photopsia. Patient can see zigzag lines in his visual field. This is known as fortification spectra. Very important MCQ. And the patient can have an enlarging blind spot with a shimmering edge. And this is known as a scintillating or a scintillating scotoma. Okay. So over here you can see this is an enlarged blind spot which has a shimmering appearance. Okay, this is an enlarged blind spot which has a shimmering appearance. So this is known as scintillating scotoma. And these are your zigzag lines. Okay, so these are your zigzag lines which is known as fortification spectra. So these are the commonly seen visual auras in migraine. Okay, so what is the cause for this aura? So what is the cause for this aura? This is due to cortical spreading depression. Okay, the mechanism of aura is due to cortical spreading depression. So usually it start, starts in the occipital cortex and then it progresses anteriorly at a rate of three, three, 2 to 3 millimeters per minute. Okay, this is a very very important MCQ. What is the reason for aura and migraine? It is due to cortical spreading depression. Alright. Now coming to the next phase, that is the prodromal phase. This lasts for around few hours to days. The symptoms seen over here, patient will have yawning, increasing fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, mood swings, food cravings, neck discomfort and polyuria. So these are the symptoms seen in the prodromal phase. Next, during the headache phase, so what is a classical textbook description of migraine headache? It's unilateral, throbbing in nature, it's moderate to severe in intensity and the headache is aggravated by movement. So usually the patient will prefer to sit in a dark quiet room during the attack of migraine. Patient will also have nausea and vomiting, photophobia as well as phonophobia. So this is the, about the headache phase. And then after the headache subsides, the patient will go for the postdromal phase. This lasts for around a few hours to around one day. Patient is going to have fatigue, difficulty in concentration and some mild neck discomfort. Okay, so these are about the four phases of migraine. Remember that the aura phase will only be present in 20 to 25% of the migraine patients. 
now coming to the short discussion on pathogenesis so mainly the pathogenesis of migraine is due to dysfunction of the monoaminergic sensory control systems in the brain stem okay so what are the important molecules or neurotransmitters involved in migraine so we have the calcitonin gene related peptide so this is very very important we also have certain drugs that act in cgrp so cgrp antagonists are known as gepans so this is a very very important mcq question okay we also have monoclonal antibodies against cgrp an important example is erinumab an important example is erinumab this is an important MCQ question. So remember, CGRP antagonists are known as GEPANs and a monoclonal antibody against it. An important example is erinumab. And then serotonin. So serotonin is very, very important. A major class of drugs that are used for acute migraine are serotonin agonists. Okay, so we have non-selective agonists and selective agonists. So the important non-selective agonists at the 5-HT receptor or serotonin receptor are the ergot alkaloids. Or the ergot alkaloids. And then we have selective agonists. Okay, important class of selective agonists are 5-HT-1B-1D agonists. So these are the triptans, which are very important drugs used in acute attack of migraines. Another uh, not very commonly used class of drugs are the 5-HT-1F agonists, which are known as ditans. Okay, is an important MCQ. And then dopamine. So dopamine is also very important in migraine pathogenesis. That's why we commonly use dopamine antagonists like domperidone and metoclopramide in the treatment of acute migraine. Okay, now coming to the diagnostic criteria. Okay, so this is a simplified diagnostic criteria where, where the patient should have repeated attacks of headache or episodic headache that lasts from 4 to 72 hours. The headache should last from 4 to 72 hours. The patient should have a normal neurological examination with no other cause of headache and at least two of the following symptoms unilateral plane, which is throbbing in quality, aggravated by movement, and moderate to severe in intensity. So, this is a classical description of migraine headache. So, patient should have at least two of these features plus at least one of the following that is nausea or vomiting and photophobia and phonophobia. So, this is the diagnostic criteria for migraine. Okay, now coming to the treatment of migraine. So, how are you going to treat an acute attack of migraine? So, the three important classes of drugs that we are going to use are NSAIDs, 5-HT agonists, both selective and non-selective and then dopamine antagonists okay so these are the three important classes of drugs that we're going to use in an acute attack of migraine so depending what drug we're going to use depends on the severity of migraine it depends on the severity of migraine so in case the patient is going to have a mild attack so in that case you're going to use NSAIDs if the patient is going to have a severe or a moderate attack that time we're going to use a triptans that time we are going to use triptans or 5-HT agonists. Okay, so what are the commonly used NSAIDs? Remember, NSAIDs are used for mild attacks. So we have a combination of paracetamol, aspirin and caffeine. Then we have naproxen, ibuprofen and diclofenac. Okay, now coming to the triptans. So 5-HT, 1B and 1D agonists. These are known as triptans. They are used for moderate to severe attacks of migraines. So we have various different types of triptans and each have their own unique pharmacokinetic properties. So we look into that now. So the most effective triptans are Risa triptan and Eli triptan. So what, what defines or what decides how, how effective a triptan is, is based on the Tmax. The Tmax of the triptan. So this is a very, very important MCQ. So what pharmacokinetic property determines the efficacy of a triptan is the Tmax. Okay, and then we have sumatriptan and zolmitriptan. So these two are special in the sense that they are present in multiple formulations. So they are present as IM preparations, subcutaneous preparations, oral preparations, and even intranasal sprays. And then well-tolerated triptans, which have a better side effect profile, are frovatriptan and naratriptan. So the issues with triptan is they cause vasoconstriction. So they are absolutely contraindicated in patients with cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. And remember, they are not effective in patients who have migraine with aura or they are not effective in classical migraine. Even if you are going to use triptans for patients with migraine with aura, it should be used after the aura phase. They should, they should not be used during the aura phase. Okay, another issue is headache recurrence is very common. So how to deal with this is always when you are giving triptans, always when you are giving triptans, you should combine them with a long acting NSAID. You should combine them with a long acting NSAID. So a common combination that we use is sumatriptan along with naproxen. So always co-administer with a long acting NSAID. 
to prevent headache recurrence. Okay, next we have our non-selective 5-HT agonists. So these are our ergot alkaloids like ergotamine and dihydroergotamine. Uh, the advantage of ergot alkaloids is headache re recurrence is less. So compared to triptans, headache recurrence is going to be less, but nausea and vomiting are going to be more pronounced over here. Okay, and the next class of drugs that we use as we discussed are dopamine antagonists. So the commonly used ones are domperidone and metoclopramide. So as we discussed earlier, dopamine is a very important molecule in the pathogenesis of migraine. And not only in that, during an acute attack of migraine, the GI motility is going to be decreased. GI motility is going to be decreased. So most of the drugs that you are going to give orally are not going to be effective because of this impaired GI motility. So these dopamine antagonists are going to address this issue because they are prokinetic because of their prokinetic properties it's going to address this issue of GI motility and all your oral drugs are going to get absorbed better in an acute attack of migraine okay so this is about the management of an acute attack now coming to the treatment of or coming to the prophylaxis so, so how are you going to prevent migraine so who are the candidates who are the ideal candidates for prophylactic therapy for migraine are patients who have attacks of more than four per month so patients having more four or more attacks per month are ideal candidates and obviously patients who have chronic migraine patients are having patients are having chronic migraine so how do you define chronic migraine so number one patients who have eight or more patients who have eight or more attacks per month or or when the patient has at least 15 days of headache 15 days of headache per month so these are known as these patients are known as suffering from chronic migraine so the patients having more than four attacks per month you can consider prophylactic therapy and surely you have to consider in patients who are having chronic migraine so what are the different drugs we use for prophylactic therapy so we have beta blockers like propranolol timolol antidepressants like amitriptyline nortriptyline venlafaxin and then anticonvulsants like topiramate and valpromate topiramate interestingly unlike other anticonvulsants it will cause weight loss Usually anticonvulsants are going to cause weight gain. Topiramate is going to cause weight loss. But the problem with topiramate, it can cause glaucoma. Okay, topiramate can cause glaucoma and it can also cause renal calculi. So it's very important that you get an ophthal consult before starting a patient on topiramate. Next, serotonergic drugs like pisotifen. However, this is not commonly used anymore. And then other drugs like flunarazine. So this is a calcium channel blocker. And then ARBs like candisartan. Okay, other modalities we have single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulation on a botulinum toxin A. Okay, so this is very important. This is specifically used for chronic migraine. Okay, this drug is specifically used for chronic migraine. And then your CGRP receptor antagonist. So we discussed the antagonists are known as GEPANS. CGRP antagonists are known as GEPANS. And the important monoclonal antibody against CGRP is known as erinumab. It's an important MCQ question. Okay, now coming to migraine variants. So as we discussed during aura, aura phase, the most common type of aura is going to be visual aura. So you're going to have your zigzag lines, your scintillating scotoma, so your fortification spectra. So these are commonly seen visual aura. Sometimes aura will present as neurological deficits. Okay, aura can present as neurological deficits. Okay, so this is the basis for your migraine variants. Okay, one of the most important migraine variants is bacillar migraine or migraine with brainstem aura. So in this patient is going to have uh, features of brainstem dysfunction during the aura phase. So it's very common in younger patients, common in children. Patients are going to have temporary cortical blindness, dysarthria, vertigo, ataxia and other features of brainstem dysfunction. Next you're going to have ophthalmoplegic migraine. Patients going to have transient third nerve palsy. Patients going to have transient third nerve palsy with or without pupillary involvement. So important MCQ, what is the most common cranial nerve involved in ophthalmoplegic migraine? It is a third cranial nerve, rarely the sixth cranial nerve. And then retinal migraine, patients going to have unilocular, uh, transient uniocular, uh, uniocular visual loss. And then familial hemiplegic migraine this is a very, very important MCQ. Okay, there are three types of familial hemiplegic migraine. Type 1 is the most common, 50% of the cases is due to mutation in P by Q voltage gated calcium channel. Type 2 is the second most common, is due to mutation in sodium potassium ATPase pump. And type 3 is due to mutation in neuronal voltage gated sodium channel. So remember the names of this channel, it's a very very important MCQ question. 
Next, coming to status migranosis. So just like status epilepticus, in status migranosis, the patient's initially going to have a unilateral headache, which then goes on to become generalized or bilateral. It is severe, continuous and unremitting. Okay, it's very rare, but very a disabling condition. So this is known as status migranosis. And very rarely in migraine, you can have lymphocytosis in the CF, CSF. So this is known as migraine with CSF pleocytosis. It is also known as headache with neurological deficits and CSF lymphocytosis. So this is about migraine. I think I've covered most of the important points. Thank you.